After the Julio-Claudian dynasty in the first two-thirds of the um, first century, Nero committed suicide in 68. After Nero's suicide began a bizarre year, uh, a year in which um, there were many conflicts in the empire and four people claimed to be emperor during that year. We therefore call the year 69 the year of four emperors. The victor out of that mess that was the year 69 was the emperor Vespasian who set up a new dynasty in Rome. We call it the Flavian dynasty, Nero, I'm sorry, not Nero, um, Vespasian. And then he will be succeeded by his two sons, Titus and Domitian. Vespasian, you might be familiar with Vespasian from uh, the writings of Josephus. When the Jews revolted against Rome in 66, one of those few blots on the Pax Augusta, and one of the reasons the Romans took that revolt so seriously was because they wanted to restore the peace, um, Josephus was a general for the Jews fighting against the Romans initially. He was captured by the Roman Emperor Vespasian, and it was under captivity by Vespasian and ultimately sponsorship by Vespasian that Josephus wrote his account of the Jewish revolt we know of as the Jewish War. Therefore, jo Josephus has this unique perspective where he's writing from a Jewish perspective, but he's also writing from a Roman perspective, and he's writing under the commission of an emperor that in fact overcame him and captured him. And so from a Jewish perspective, he's often viewed as a traitor. From a Roman perspective, he's viewed as Jewish. And so he sort of fits in neither camp, which is precisely because why he is so useful for us as historians. Vespasian is also uh, famous for launching one of the great building projects in the history of Rome, the great Colosseum, the Flavian Amphitheater, as it was originally called, uh, was begun under him, completed under his son. Vespasian was the general who fought, initially put down the Jewish revolt in Israel, but he left before it was over in order to become emperor, to claim his position as emperor. He left behind his son, and it was his son Titus who, in fact, sacked the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, this in the year 70, a very important year for uh, New Testament, the year 70 AD, the sack of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. And that, that temple, of course, has never been rebuilt since. Um, Titus thereafter um, finished up with the Jewish revolt, went back home to Rome, eventually succeeded his father in 79 and ruled as emperor for two years, 79 to 81. He was succeeded by his brother Domitian, who ruled from 81 to 96. Um, Domitian gets a lot of bad press, and it's probably well-earned. He seemed to disrespect just about everyone around him, including uh, elites, including senators, including important uh, people in the Roman Empire, uh, so much so that they eventually hired a professional wrestler and drowned him in his bathtub. It is possible, though the evidence is not strong, that there was a persecution of Christians under Domitian. Some people think that the book of Revelation which talks about John being exiled to the island of Patmos. Some people think that, many people think, that was written during the reign of Domitian. If so, then there was some sort of persecution going on that caused John to be exiled to the island of Patmos. So the problem is that we have no other evidence of any persecution going on during that period of time. So if, if there was, it was very limited and very local. But it is possible that the book of Revelation was written during this time um, as a result of persecution under Domitian. I also have a theory that the book of Revelation might have been written earlier, but that's for another day. Okay, so that's the big picture of Roman government in, at least the leadership, imperial government, in that first century AD. Now I want to talk about some of the nuts and bolts of Roman government and culture because this is going to be very important for us as we go forward. First of all, Roman government in the provinces. How did the Romans govern their provinces, not just Rome? There are two kinds of Roman provinces, and I won't go into the reasons for the distinctions, but there are imperial provinces that are ruled by, theoretically by the emperor himself, but he sends a governor there to rule in his name, and we call that governor 
the legate. Legate. We use the term delegate in English. Legate is the name of the governor who represents the emperor in an imperial province. And these are considered to be the more important provinces. Then there are senatorial provinces ruled by the Senate. And the, name, the proper title of a governor over a senatorial province is a proconsul. This is going to be important as we look at the book of Acts and other portions of the New Testament, this distinction. And by the way, a single Roman province is not necessarily constantly either senatorial or imperial. For example, the island of Cyprus at one point was senatorial, and then it was imperial, and then it went back to senatorial. And so the title of the governor shifts not only from place to place, but also potentially from time to time in the same place. So we have to watch that. And this is going to be very important because one of the remarkable things about the book of Acts is Luke, the author, pays close attention to this kind of stuff in a remarkable way. There are also Roman colonies. Roman colonies were, were cities the Romans established for basically as a retirement program for ex-soldiers. One of our most two colonies that are pretty famous uh, from the New Testament. One is Philippi. Another one is Corinth. So Roman colonies have uh, a special name for the title of the people who rule over, the magistrates who rule over that town. They're called in Latin duoviri and in Greek strategoi, literally generals. Then there are minor provinces that tend to be under the authority of the larger provinces, and those minor provinces will have minor governors with titles like prefect and procurator. This is important for the New Testament because initially, at least, the Roman province of Judea is under the auspices of the Roman imperial province of Syria. The Roman province, then the Roman leader, governor of Judea is going to be called initially a prefect and later a procurator under the supervision of the legate of Syria up north. All Roman provinces, regardless of whether they're imperial or senatorial provinces or colonies or minor provinces, they are all dominated by Roman law. And the fundamental principle of the Roman law is, is this just? The Romans are interested in principle. They're also interested in precedent, but they're very interested in trying to figure out what is the just uh, response to any particular situation. Roman law is very organized and Roman citizens have access to Roman law. Even Roman non-citizens have access to Roman law, but there's different principles apply. Which brings us to Roman citizenship. Roman citizenship is very, very important. Roman citizens have particular rights. Um, so for example, while Roman citizens always have access to um, uh, Roman protection, um, Roman court system, um, for example, if a Roman citizen is arrested, that person, um, uh, there has to be cause for the arrest that has to be demonstrated. You cannot be tortured or beaten without, uh, as, if you're a Roman citizen. Um, if you are found guilty of a capital crime, you cannot be crucified if you're a Roman citizen. And every Roman citizen has the right of appeal. You can appeal to the emperor himself. This is going to become very important also in the book of Acts because Paul, as we'll find out, is a Roman citizen. Of course, the official language of the Roman Empire is Latin, but that's the language of government. It's also the language of the western part of the empire, but in the eastern part of the empire, and really throughout the empire, the trade language, the common language, the lingua franca, is Greek. Especially the Greek of the streets, the common Greek, which we know of as Koine Greek, and the New Testament is, is in fact written in Koine Greek. When you put all of these pieces together, Roman law, Roman government, Roman citizenship, Latin language, Koine Greek as the lingua franca, and remember Aramaic is the first language of people in, in uh, Roman Judea, so Jesus' first language would, would have been Aramaic, but many, many people are bilingual even trilingual or quadrilingual because it would not be un uncommon for somebody in Judea at this time to speak Aramaic as a first language, Greek as a trade language, Hebrew as a language of worship, and if they had anything to do with the Roman government, some Latin. And so uh, the linguistic atmosphere 
was, was uh, very much mixed. And because of this mixed linguistic atmosphere, you also have mixed access, if you will, to all kinds of literary traditions, philosophical traditions, strands of ideas, mixture of cultures, and this whole combination we know of as Greco-Roman culture. The world of the New Testament is dominated by Greco-Roman culture with a good dose of Hebrew thrown in for good measure. And that is the world that shapes the text of the New Testament.